ISO.org is the premier online Bible school developed by Perry Stone. ISO.org has dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, and thousands of students all over the world. Sign up today. Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Well, greetings to the worldwide audience of the Manifest Telecast. I'm Perry Stone, the teacher for this program. Most of you know that probably 35 to 38 times a year, and that's uh, once a week, we come to you from programs that are taped in Israel. Occasionally, we also have been to the country of Jordan to Petra. And these are the most popular programs. I know that at times when I have attempted to do uh, an excerpt from some of our live conferences, people enjoy it, but they don't really get the end of it. They only get maybe 22 or 23 minutes of the beginning of a 70 minute message. Here in Israel, however, we try to time it where you can get the basic teaching on a particular subject within that time frame. Now, where I'm standing right now is in the area of Tiberias. And Tiberias is the place where the famous Sea of Galilee is located. There are many hotels. It's a tourist site because literally millions of tourists visit this area every year. But directly in the center of the town, the modern town, is the facility that I'm standing in. I say facility, it's the ruins of an ancient building. And I've always watched this area for many years and I thought one of these days we're going to do a program and show some people some very interesting things that are inside this facility or this old ancient building. And one of those is what I'm showing you right now. Now I'm going to explain what this is in a moment but I want you to take a look at this and I'm going to share something with you, not about this object, but an object very similar to this. And I wanna go back to the story of Matthew's gospel very, very briefly, because we're gonna be talking about the resurrection of the dead in a moment. But I wanna go back to Matthew's gospel where it says that Christ was born in Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. In the Christmas stories or the Christmas plays that we were in as children. Many of you remember what a manger was or what we thought it was. It was two pieces of wood in a V shape with straw in it and a plastic baby Jesus that was laying in it. But an actual manger was made out of rock and it was very similar in shape to an ossuary. And let me explain, it's much smaller than this. It's about half this size. And what it was, some of them were this deep carved into the rock, and it was like a box. Uh, picture a big, large cardboard box. It's maybe a foot to two foot deep. And what this was for, it was for two things. You could put water in it, and an animal could, could get a drink from the, the water. And the second thing is you could put grain in it, and the animal could feed from the grain. Now this was actually, not this, but what I'm describing to you right now, was what was classified in the English translation of the Bible, a manger. This, however, is different. This is an ossuary. And what these were, if the, these were actually uh, what we would call today coffins. And they were made of stone and it's where the body of an individual was laid. Now I'm gonna give you a little history to go back in some time to help you understand some scriptures before we get into the idea of the resurrection of the dead, specifically the resurrection of the dead in Christ that the apostle Paul spoke about. Now back in the time of Christ and even today among devout Jews, they do not embalm the body. Embalming is a practice that actually started in Egypt. And, and when I say started in Egypt, it's known in the Bible. The first biblical reference, of course, is from the country of Egypt, where they took the body of Joseph, for example, and they embalmed him. Now, the Egyptians were masters at embalming because you find today and over many years, mummies that were wrapped up. And when they unwrap that mummy, you can still see the dried skin and you can almost see the features of the person. And there are thousands thousands of years of age. Now, in Judaism, however, uh, especially in the earlier days, and even today among devout Jews, the blood remains in the body, 
and the person, let's say if it's in the city of Jerusalem and someone passes away, uh, if it's at night, the, the funeral will be immediately in the morning. If it's in the morning, they call people together and it can be the same. It can actually be, be de depending upon, of course, the religious group or if there's people coming in, etc. There's a lot of different uh, things connected to this, but many of what we call the Orthodox will bury it within hours of the death once the death has been uh, declared. And the person is often wrapped in a prayer shawl and the two or the burial place is above ground. They don't dig a six foot grave the way we do in the West, but they place the person above, uh, 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 on a slab above ground. Then they place, just, just take one of these and flip it upside down. And that's what it looks like. It looks like uh, a, a tomb or a coffin above ground. And you see these, we'll probably show you some clips of these. You see these all over the Mount of Olives. And many times on the Mount of Olives, you will see where the, the slab, the top slab of that tomb has rocks on top of it. For example, several years ago, we went and uh, we taped at uh, the, the grave of a man named Oscar Schindler. And that's the man that the movie was made of, Schindler's List, that protected Jews during the Holocaust. And there were stones that were placed on top of that tomb. And the stone, you know, a stone is something that's solid. It's something that, you know, it, it's going to endure for a long time. But in, in, in respect and memory of that person many times, you will see a stone that will be placed reminding the, the, that, the, that you have visited there, you have respected the person, and you're giving honor to their memory. Now, let's go back to the time of Christ, because there's some very interesting things that happened in the time of Jesus. And I'm going to come out here in the front and kind of lean up against this, and I'm just going to talk to you uh, like I'm at home. Uh, we're we're going to drink some coffee together and have a little bit of teaching. In the time of Jesus, there were what were called uh, tombs or sepulchers. Now, a sepulcher was picture a limestone hill of solid limestone rock. And what they would do is they would dig into that limestone and they would form a very large tunnel, a very large tunnel. And then to the left and the right side of that tunnel, they would dig niches on the left and the right side. Sometimes there would be layers. You would find a lower layer, a middle layer, and sometimes even a third layer in these particular niches. Now, what they did with these niches was the following. When a person died, and we can go back, for example, to Lazarus, who was wrapped in linens, according to the Bible. We can go back to Christ, who there was 100 pounds of linens and spices that one of his followers, we have Joseph of Arimathea, who assisted him in his burial, of Christ's burial. And so the spices were to anoint the body, and then the linens, the body was wrapped in those linens. Now, imagine this. John's gospel says 100 pounds of linens and spices that were involved with the burial of Jesus Christ. Now, the linens are interesting because here's what would happen. They would take that corpse that is now wrapped in linen, and in the Roman time, they would stick it into one of those niches, and it would remain there. It would remain there until the body would completely deteriorate, and it would go back to simply the bones, the skeleton or the bones. Now, approximately a year later, and I'm going to give you a verse on this in the Bible, approximately a year later, the family would go back to that tomb and they would take that body out. They would unwrap it and they would take the bones and wash them down with, uh, with wine and with oil. And they would then place the bones in what was called an ossuary. And this is what this was. This is one that's been damaged here, but you can see the very heavy stone lid. I mean, Two men cannot even lift this. It takes probably eight men to pick this up. And that was the lid that went over top of it. Now, one of the reasons that the Jewish people or the people even in the Roman period would make these lids so heavy is because at times, and we know this from archaeological evidence, at times a person may be buried with their jewelry or they may be buried with something that was very special to them and it would be of value. To prevent thieves from getting in, they would place these large, large, uh, rock uh, tops on top, and it protected not only the bones of the person, but it protected it from thieves. However, when you go throughout Israel and you see some of these places, there's caves where men, you can go to Israel on, on uh, national parks and you'll see these, you'll notice that these are busted open from the side. 
So what happened was many years later, people would come to the Holy Land and realize somebody was buried. And so they would chip away sometimes at the side of these and you'll find holes where people would actually create a hole and reach in there to prevent them from trying to remove the cover from the top. And so that has happened where grave robbers is what they would call them. So let's go back to this. Now, in the, in the New Testament, there was an occasion where a, man, a young man came to Jesus and believed he was the Messiah and wanted to follow him. But he said to Christ, let me go bury my father. And it almost seems very cold and almost crude that Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, come and follow me. Now, as a kid, I'll be very honest with you. I read that and I thought, how cold can you be? Because everybody knows that if you have a father or mother or a child that has died, you want to respect them. You want to have what we call a funeral. You want to celebrate their memory. But pay careful attention to what I'm going to say. Jesus was not, and I repeat, he was not telling him, don't go to your father's funeral. Here's what was happening. The young man was coming back to the actual sepulcher where his father's body had deteriorated in one year. He was going to go back and unwrap that body and take the skeletal remains, wash them down, and then pray the blessings of prayer over, over him. Of course, he's died, but there are special memories and blessings of the memory. Then he was going to place them in an ossuary that had been made and lay the bones in it and give it a permanent burial place at that point forever. Now, the point that Jesus was making was this. Your father has already passed. A year has gone away. Let people that deal with burial things deal with his burial bones. He's gone. You come and follow me. So these were ossuaries and these were where the final remains were placed. And of course, some of them were much smaller and we'll get some pictures of one. In fact, there's one back here. We have a lot of graffiti. We don't want to just show the graffiti that's on the walls, but right here is one that you can see. And that's a smaller one. And really that's about the average size. You had to be pretty wealthy, uh, a pretty wealthy family individual to have uh, these made. And of course there are beautiful designs at times that are cut on these. Sometimes they would even put the name of the person and maybe something he did, or he was the son of a certain person and they'll carve that on the outside. Side. Now, one of the most famous ossuaries that were found, there were actually two of them. Uh, one of them was found in what's called the Mountain of the Evil Council in that area of the city of Jerusalem. We were there in a bus going to a, the peace forest to plant trees when a bulldozer had struck an ancient tomb. We later found out it was the tomb of Caiaphas, the high priest from back in the time of Christ. But another ossuary that was discovered, and it is on display at the, univer the, he the, um, the Hebrew uh, University, the museum, not the Hebrew University, Sh Israeli Museum. Thank you. I got my guide over here correcting me. The shrine of the book, the area where the shrine of the book of the Dead Sea Scrolls are. But in the Israeli Museum, there's an ossuary there and it had in it, the, the heel bone of a person that had been crucified and the nail had gone into the back of the foot near the heel, but it had bent. Apparently it may have been an olive tree and it hit a knot and it bent that nail so they couldn't get it out. So they, when the man died by crucifixion, they cut the top part of the ankle and, and put it in. And that had actually been discovered in an old ossuary, which is one of the very great evidences of an actual crucifixion or the remains of someone who had been crucified. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out is this. We do know that when a person dies, according to the Bible, God said to Adam, from dust you came, to dust you shall return. So we do know this, that even though this is flesh, as long as my blood is moving in my body, it keeps my flesh t uh, moist, it keeps it tender, uh, it keeps it where the nervous system can, you know, you can feel it when you burn it and you pinch it and it gets cold and it gets hot. But the moment that a person passes away and the blood ceases to flow, you'll discover that the body eventually will deteriorate. And this part that we see, which we call the flesh, actually turns back to dust again, exactly the way God said it. Many years ago, I was researching death and I found out something interesting, that in common dirt, you can find about 16 different minerals, magnesium and copper and, and, and that type of thing. And did you realize in a decayed human body, you can discover the exact same minerals that are found in common dirt? 
Why is that important? Because God said to Adam, I made you from the ground. And when you die, you're going to go back to the ground. Another simple thing, but gives us evidence that we were created by God himself. Now, when the body goes back into the dust, we know that the bones remain. But eventually, as you know, over years, those bones will eventually deteriorate as well. Now, one of the mysteries, and Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump. Then he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, that the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then back into 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said at the resurrection, this mortal body and mortality, or mortal means subject to death, this mortal body will put on immortality, meaning not subject to death, and that this corruptible body, meaning a body that deteriorates, gets old and turns to dust, will eventually put on an incorruptible body. So this happens at the resurrection of the dead. Now the question arises, what happens when a person dies? Now I'm not going to go into the process of the five strange things that everybody describes at the moment of death. This, this buzzing sound that's in their ears. Now, how do I say, how do I say they, they describe this the moment of death? Because people have died and been revived and come back and told about it. The buzzing noise, the light, the exiting of the body, the entrance going into a strange tunnel many times. And so here's what I want to say. In the Christian faith, there's different ideas about what happens at death. There's wonderful people, some of them are very dear friends, who believe in what's called soul sleep. And they use the term soul sleep because Paul said, we shall not all sleep, but we'll be changed at the resurrection. And then Paul uses the metaphor sleep several times. And Isaiah the prophet or some of the prophets talk about those who sleep in the dust. So using that phrase, many believe in what's called soul sleep, that you are a body. You can see the body. You're looking at this peristone body right here. You're a soul, which is mind, intellect and, will, intellect and will. And you're a spirit that looks just like you that lives inside of your body. It's almost like the air in a balloon. Whatever the shape of the balloon is, you breathe in it, the air takes on that shape of that balloon. So your spirit is the shape and form of your physical body. Now at death, this is what Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we know that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 talked about that uh, something happened to him and he doesn't know if he was having a vision or if he was in the body or out of the body. So in other words, he was having an experience where the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 12, he was caught up into the third heaven and saw things that it was impossible to even talk about. And when he was caught up into the third heaven, he describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, being caught up into a place called paradise. Now paradise is where the soul and spirit of a righteous person who has a covenant with God, and in our case, based on the New Testament, believes that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Son of God, and they've asked Christ through his sacrifice on the cross to cleanse them and forgive them of their sins. These individuals at death are carried by angels, and we can read about that in Luke 16, to the presence of God in the heavenly paradise. So there's two groups, as I said earlier. Some believe the soul and spirit stays in the spot where it died. If you drowned in the ocean, the soul and spirit is asleep in the ocean. If you, for example, were uh, slain somewhere and you're, you know, the body is missing and it's maybe in a, on a mountain, it remains there. Then at the resurrection, it awakes from that spot and meets the Lord. However, here's a verse in 1 Thessalonians 4 that helps explain it. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes back for the church or he comes back for the saints, he says that he brings those who have known Christ with him. In other words, in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Bible says we who are alive will meet those who have died in the air. They are there in the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere with Christ. They raise first for the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then the living will be caught up to meet him. So in other words, in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I think it's verse 14, the Apostle Paul tells us that when Christ returns from the third heaven to the clouds of the air to catch up the living saints, he brings those 
dead souls. Now, they're dead in body on earth, but they're not dead in the sense of they're dead in heaven. They actually are still existing and living in heaven. The spirit can't die. He brings that soul and spirit with him at his return and they receive a brand new resurrected body. Now the resurrection, I'm telling you, is an absolute stunning, amazing mystery. Even Paul himself said it was a mystery. So my point is this, that those who have died in Christ, they're not sleeping somewhere on the earth. They are absent from the body and now present with the Lord and they will know when Christ is coming back again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17, they'll be the first to know because he will bring the soul and spirit with him. For example, my grandfather, my grandmother on both sides of my family, my own father who's been with the Lord, they're now in paradise. But when Jesus comes back, and he comes to catch up the living and change them from mortal to immortality, they're going to be the first ones to know what's about to happen. And they're going to be raised and given what's called a glorified body. And that body will have no pain, no sickness. It's called in Hebrews, the spirit of just men and just meaning righteous, the spirit of just men made perfect. And so there'll be a perfected, resurrected body. I've had people kind of humorously ask me, they said, I'm pretty heavy. I'll weigh a lot. Well, I'm, am I going to weigh this much at the resurrection? No, because that's your flesh. And your flesh is what carries the heaviness and the weight, excuse me, but we call it fat. And so you're not going to have that. You will have a beautiful spirit that dwells on the inside of you that's not affected by the things of the flesh. And everyone who's ever seen anyone who has passed away. And there have been people who've had heart attacks that have seen heaven. There have been people who have clinically died and come back that have seen heaven. And everybody they see who died old now looks very, very young. Most of them are described, their spirit is of looking like 25 to 30 years of age. Now, there are so many mysteries about the third heaven, so many mysteries about the resurrection of the dead that I decided to write a book that deals with the mysteries of the third heaven. And I want you to get the detail, the Greek word studies, the history, the backdrop, all these things that are combined together to help you understand the mystery of what happens when a righteous person dies. So we're gonna offer that on the Manifest Telecast and I'll be back right after the announcement of the resource material and sharing with you where we're going to be coming to you, coming to minister and also some great conferences. God bless you. Do you know the many secrets of paradise, the temporary home of the spirits and souls that have died in Christ, which is located in the third heaven? Harry Stone in his latest book, Secrets of the Third Heaven, delves into some of the most interesting, in-depth and mysterious questions ever asked about the third heaven. As a believer, can you answer these questions? At death, do all children go to heaven? Can God show you the actual day and hour when you will die? What is the difference between the human soul and spirit? Do departed saints now in heaven pray for those living on earth? In heaven, how will we communicate with people from different nations? What happens if your name is not written in the book of life? When your spirit leaves your body at death, are you naked or clothed? How is time counted in paradise and are they aware of earthly events? Will a person's body be raised from dust at the resurrection? Will we remember family members in hell once we die and enter paradise? Do infant spirits age in heaven? Do they go to the same paradise as adults? Can a person repent of sins once their spirit is out of their body? These questions along with more unusual and difficult questions concerning death, angels, heaven, and paradise are answered in Perry's latest 220-page book, Secrets of the Third Heaven. This book is filled with stunning true stories and amazing biblical word studies. This offer also includes the two audio CD teaching, Standing at the Bema. You will one day stand face to face with Christ at a judgment called the Bema. What will you be judged for and how will you answer Christ when He exposes the idle words you spoke and your actions on earth? This two hour teaching will explain from beginning to end what to expect and how you will be rewarded or stand ashamed. Perry's revelatory book and this informative audio teaching are available for your gift of just $35 or more. Call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323 or order online at perrystone.org. You may also write Perry Stone, P. 
P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. When ordering, ask for offer TH135 and enclose your gift of $35 or more. If you have questions, this book and audio teaching has the answers. Order your set today. Well, I want to thank you for joining me on Manifest. Now, we've gone back to our programs that were recently taped in Israel during one of our uh, tours, the Partners Only Tour and also our main tour. So we're going to kick back into those particular messages on location. It's a great joy to be able to tape on location from the land of the Bible. And actually, our most popular uh, programs are from the Holy Land. So I hope that you will enjoy these. Now, everyone in the United States and actually the entire world knows uh, that these are very, very perilous times right now. The only other time that I know of in world history since the creation of Adam, when the entire world was shut down, was the flood of Noah. And of course, Noah and his family, there were a total of eight, were secured inside the ark during the time of the five months of water that covered the entire earth. And of course, it was 150 days, and then it started receding after a while. I want to say to you that some of the verses that come to my mind are, in your patience, you possess your soul. And on the gift of being long-suffering or long-spirited, this is where you are absolutely going to be tested by do you have the endurance, the ability to endure. And that Greek word in Matthew 24, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved, means to bear up under pressure. Do you have that? And do you have the ability to be patient? In Daniel, it talks about wearing out the saints of the Most High God or the, the Holy Ones. And in that reference, it literally refers to the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. But that application is so real right now. So the word I want to give you is the word the Lord gave me when I was 18 years of age. I wrote in the back of a Bible, be not weary in well-doing for in due season we'll reap if we faint not. We have to pray, humble ourselves before God. I'm talking about Christians, believers. And uh, I see so many backsliders coming back to the Lord and so many people that used to mock our preaching who said, we're listening now, Perry, we're listening now. Well, uh, we're glad you're listening. But I just want to say to you that uh, these are very, very important times. And I really believe it's the third trimester birth pains. I don't have time to preach on that. That's another message. And that as we get closer to the actual messianic kingdom, we're gonna see more events happen in a succession. Um, when I talk about the Messianic Kingdom, the message now, everybody listen to me, the message now is repent for the Kingdom of Heaven is at hand. And this Gospel of the Kingdom is going to be preached. We're going to keep preaching it here on Manifest. And uh, I want you to join me on Tuesday nights. We're able to live stream around the world on Tuesday nights. I'm preaching. We start at 630 East Coast time, OCIministries.org. Remember that, OCIministries.org. And then on Thursday at our World Prayer Center, there's a small group meeting. and We're gonna bring our prayer team back when we can do that. A small team is praying for the requests that are coming in. And I, I head up a prayer there. And, and look, I see sometimes people saying, well, we don't need churches, we don't need this. Oh yes, we do. You need churches, you need ministry, you need music, you need prayer. And these are the days that we need it more than ever before. I thank you for your prayers. Also, you that have recently supported us to keep us on the air, thank you for your support. We want to do the will of God more than anything else in this world. See you next week on Manifest. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2020 Israel tour. The dates are November 23rd through December 2nd with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today. Expand your understanding of Scripture. Advance your effectiveness in ministry. Earn certification for your knowledge of the Bible. International School of the Word. Developed by Perry Stone and Dr. Brian Cutshaw, ISO.org is the premier online Bible school with dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, and thousands of students all over the world. Sign up for one of our exciting, affordable Bible courses and begin your journey at ISO.org today.